In the middle of the ongoing civilizational catastrophe, the process of a presidential election in France would be nonsensical as such. As a moment in the system, it is nonsensical. While as a contribution to world history here and now, it gains a meaning. It becomes an opportunity to contribute to reverse the, no the motion towards a fascist coup which threatens us all, as Lyndon LaRouche stressed yesterday. The question, the existential question, is how from France, a country dominated by an oligarchical elite, which is the cause of our tragedy, a public-private oligarchical elite, how can we help to get rid of the system of financial globalization? My answer is by putting Glastigal and Africa on the table, on the forefront, not as separated issues, but as a weapon, a double barrel shotgun to break the rules of the game. Glastigo is what the British Empire wants to prevent at any cost to happen in the United States, because it will put an end to the rule of the city of London, Wall Street, and the British Empire. At the same time, the British policy as an empire has always been to separate the United States from continental Europe to destroy both from within. Against its priority, now it is to destroy the United States as a nation state, my commitment, our commitment, is to respond to the Glass-Steagall drive there in the United States with a similar motion in Europe as an anti-British transoceanic bridge to revive in such a way what the British fear the most, the spirit of the League of Armed Neutrality, the support of Russia, France, and Spain to the young American Republic with a credit-based and national banking system transferring now the fraudulent speculative debt from the domain of the states, of the sovereign states, as today they are poisoned by toxic assets, back into the accounts of the mega banks and the insurance companies. Let the poisoners be poisoned by their own poison. <laughs> Africa has been historically the worst victim of the British Empire. With the cooperation of other junior European empires, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Dutch, which established the rule of slavery until today with the slavery of the debt and of imposed unfair terms of exchange. So the key of Glass-Steagall to open the door for a new worldwide platform of productive development, a platform with new technologies, more productive per capita and per square kilometer, a more human identity for mankind should lead necessarily to the rise of Africa as a weapon pointed to the heart of the oligarchy. A community of purpose of Europe and the United States to save Africa from the grip of the British Empire, starting from a shared Glass-Steagall principle, is what will uniquely establish our American-European partnership for the good of the other, Africa representing the welfare of humanity as a whole. In a way, it is to achieve something that a lot of people have not understood. To achieve something today, what I am convinced that Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Charles de Gaulle could have achieved if Roosevelt had not died and de Gaulle been kicked out from power by the pro-British, pro-Truman foreign forces in France, within France. Most people see a presidential election as a sort 
of beauty contest, an attempt to be elected at a certain point in time to exert power as a result of a political career rising from the base to the top, starting from some local election, from compromise to compromise, to the top. They are controlled fools in normal times because they accept, if they accept that environment, they accept to be what the others want them to be. They don't accept the rule of principle. Now today, in today's France, in the context of this crisis of civilization, of the horrors that all of them, all of you know, they condemn themselves, if they do that, to become much worse than just fools. They become traitors to their countries and civilization. Because to go along is to accept the rule of the game, the destruction of civilization itself. And that's the rule of a game in an organized election as it is organized today. Therefore, when I speak about Glass-Steagall and the development of Africa, what I say is not particularly welcomed. It is not particularly liked by the prevailing principalities and powers in France, who have become the servants of destruction, and is also at first rejected by a majority of a pessimistic public opinion, dominated by fears and prejudices induced by those powers that through their control of images and noises, images and noises of the media. Glass-Steagall may be a good choice, but it is incompatible with our principle of universal banking. You cannot put on the table such a concept after 30 years of deregulation, it is just impossible. Africans are not capable to absorb modern technologies. Isn't it obvious? The last 30 years have proved it. It is dangerous to challenge the megabanks. They are too powerful. You are an utopian. We have our habits, and the Africans have theirs. To be a leader against such flying squadrons of impotent crap, you have to be unpopular with the powers that generate them and the public opinion that swallow that crap. Unpopularity is therefore a precondition for a honest honestly helpful presidential campaign. Is it so painful to be unpopular? Yes, you would say at first, if you define your identity through pleasure and pain. Not really. If you identify yourself with a service of truth and ideas, because it makes you feel good when you know that you have put your mission first, your mission to improve before the pleasure to seduce and be liked. And with the rising tide of the mass strike, the indignation of the indignados, a mass strike ferment in Europe, succeeding and interfacing with a mass strike ferment in the United States. People are now reacting to something that they don't like. They experience a passion for justice when confronted to our extremely prevailing injustice. My task as a presidential candidate is neither to please them from under, nor to give them orders from above about what to do, but to provide leadership to try to move their passions 
towards the truth, to make them discover in themselves their responsibility for the other. More than often, you have to kick them gently in the ass. Or better, induce themselves to kick themselves in their own ass. Hey, look at the world you are in. More than one billion human beings are suffering from hunger, are about to die. There is an increase of 50 million of them each year now, and probably much more in the coming years. And the banks are begging of food as it is worth currency. While the producers, and you have seen that yesterday, are destroyed, systematically stifled, as we saw yesterday. Do you want to make a career in such a world? Do you want your sons to make a career in such a world? Do you want your girls to seduce somebody making a career in such a world, or be seduced, or be in a seductive career in a world of corpses? And that's the question today. At that point, if you raise that question, you are not popular. You are not the nice guy around the corner. But as the disintegration of society proceeds, you are trusted. You start to be trusted. Precisely because you have helped raise the human quality of discovery and of reflexive insights in the minds of people like a good doctor would do. You may, not, you may not like that good doctor. He or she tells you the truth about your problem, about your disease. But you trust him because he inspires a cure. He doesn't consider you as a client to seduce or a number to provide with a formula or a recipe like most doctors do, unfortunately. But he considers you, this good doctor, as a human being. And a human being helped to recover his health, grow, and eventually multiply. So that's my task. And to accomplish it, it demands to go deep into the history of our nation, to encapture the best of it that it gave to the world beyond and above the horrible condition in which France is today. Which means that you have not only to be unpopular with your life, but you have to be also unpopular with the dead. The horrendous shape of our country today demands even more to be unpopular with the dead. To revive the principle of the republic against the prevailing oligarchy, you have to dissipate the destructive legends. Louis XIV, Napoleon, Rousseau, Laplace. To make, so to say, come back from the dead, Rabelais, Louis XI, the Villons, Cousa, and all the others that inspired France from Plato to Einstein, to Einstein and his friendship with Langevin. This demands, in turn, an internal fight, a fight inside all of us to be able to start a dialogue with these shadows who become alive, to address your contemporaries from the present so as to provoke them to be responsible for the future. And that's a fight in the process of a presidential election. It means to reestablish a principle of hospitality against chauvinism. The nation as an idea corresponding or congruent with the dynamics of the universe. Not the nation as a given tradition, but the nation as a development, as a response to a challenge of the times. It is the idea of America, as made by the best of Europe, the commitment of Cusa and his followers, 
what Lin insisted on yesterday. The Republican impulse freed from the oligarchical principle, freed from the stifling into a tradition. When you hear respect the tradition, prepare your fist, intellectual fist. It is also what de Gaulle experienced when France was occupied as a territory in May, June 1940, and its population had fallen into the most disgusting fear and cowardice. What was left? The principle of a nation, its legitimacy as an idea against the state of mind of its own people and also against the legal, perfectly legal vote of the French National Assembly of the Third Republic to give full powers to the Franco-Fascist Pétain. The famous from the Gaulle, toute ma vie je me suis fait une certaine idée de la France, le sentiment me l'inspire aussi bien que la raison. All my life, I conceived a certain idea of France, sentiment as well as reason has inspired it to me. Where the goal met the resources for such a legitimacy? In the genius of France, in the historical nation, uh, genius of a nation, but not as a fixed collection of things or a chaotic population as it was then and as it is today. On the contrary, as a self-evolving idea penetrated and changed by foreign currents, the nation as a reflection of the universe, the nation not as a thing in itself, the nation finite at a given moment, but unbounded as a universe, unbounded by the mind of the other cultures like a willful and always perfected human discovery. The nation is a willful and always perfected human discovery. It's not something in some place. Let's listen what the goal had to say about that in a speech given for the 60th anniversary of the Alliance Francaise, the epitome of so-called French culture. This was in Algiers on October 30, 1943. However, he said, the bright flame of French thought, how could it have risen and maintained its brilliance if inversely it was not for so many elements contributed to it by the mind of other cultures. France, century by century, and until the current tragedy, has succeeded to maintain abroad the influence of its genius. That would have been impossible if France would have lacked the desire or would not have made the effort of being penetrated by foreign currents. In this matter, Autarky would rapidly provoke debasement. Undoubtedly, in the artistic, scientific, philosophical order, humanity should not be deprived of the driving force of international emulation, and these high values would not subsist inside the tortured psychology of intellectual nationalism. We have, once and for all, come to the conclusion that it's by free spiritual and moral relationships established among ourselves and with others that our cultural influence can expand to the advantage of all and inversely what we are worth can increase. This speech, you may have noticed, was pronounced in Africa and in the middle of the storms of World War II. In the middle of such storms, it was from Africa, first from sub-Sahelian Africa, with the soldiers of Leclerc and our dear friend Jean-Gabriel Revaudalon, and then from Algiers and Tunisia, that France was recovered. Remember that the famous Churchill Roosevelt de Gaulle meeting of 1942 took place in Casablanca, Morocco, after the disembarkment of the American forces in Morocco. Remember that the Liberation Army that disembarked in southern France in August 15, 1944, 
was mainly composed of African native soldiers, not Francais de Souche, as they say today. The tragedy of the 20th century is that after the liberation of Europe from Nazism, after the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the British imperialism struck back from the city on Wall Street with Truman in the United States and the corresponding rottenness of the Fourth Republic in my country, in France. This meant for France the revival of the delusion of the French Empire. The first Indochina War, starting from the treason of the Ho Chi Minh Leclerc 1946 agreement for a progressive independence, and then a set of horrendous and criminal colonial wars that were only put an end to by Mendes France in 1954, as for Indochina, and finally by De Gaulle in 1962, with the Peace of Evian concluded with the liberation movement of Algeria. And if you want to understand France, even today, you have to understand that these colonial wars took place between 1945 and 1962. And that was the time of my youth and what I have been fighting against. But this independence of African states, this hurricane of hope, as Kwame Nkrumah put it, became a hoax under a neo-colonial and financial occupation, corrupting the leaders of the African nations, organizing a new form of indirect submission to the imperial order, a more insidious but more demoralizing and destructive form of oppression through systematic betrayal from within. The equation of General Janssens, the Belgian commander-in-chief of the Congolese public forces, presented on July 5, 1960, which was before independence equals after independence, and that's it, proved, unfortunately, to be more and more true in terms of the continuation of oppression. So now, in the middle of these days, our days of tragedy and hope, we have our fight for the Glass-Steagall principle, the crucial point at strategic issue, the key for what de Gaulle called le salut, the salvation, to throw the usurers out of the temple as you have seen it mentioned in a recent paper by somebody, a Glass-Steagall principle, first in the United States, and then a world global Glass-Steagall based on issuance of productive credit and not of fake paper based on pounds of human flesh, which is called monetarism. This fight we are in, we are all involved in, is a question of life and death for humanity. And Eric Verag is going to tell you soon his views on a French Glass-Steagall. Let me nonetheless tell you something crucial, a direct consequence of the question of legitimacy that I mentioned before. Europe, and in particular France, because of its colonial background, have a mission to change their traditional policies towards Africa towards Africa and the Africans, because it is a change which is consubstantial of a same substance with the principle of Glass-Steagall. As we used to say far away and long ago, Africa is a litmus test for the capacity of Europe to join the dynamics of Glass-Steagall and a world-based credit system with fixed parity currencies. The salvation of Africa is consubstantial to the salvation of Europe. And the response of Europe to the Glass-Steagall principle in the United States is in turn consubstantial to the salvation of the world, of a world which is today at the brink of self-destruction. Africa is our mission, and our investment there is a debt due to past generations that we have oppressed to be paid now for the interest of future generations to come. That's a true sense of a debt. 
as my friend Marcelo Vicky put it for the Bonfica Lake Chad project, the units of measure of the costs are not in millions or billions of dollars, but in the absence of wars, the millions of human beings saved from the threat of hunger and benefiting from the means of a life defined by dignity, social peace, and also a recovered international conscience. It is nonetheless necessary, I think, to proceed further into the exploration of what Africa means for us Europeans. It is to recover for ourselves our share of humanity in acting for the benefit of those we have exploited and outraged in the past. To save Africa and the Africans from a terrible death through the increase of the physical power to continue to exist and avoid destruction is for us the path to recover our own principle of humanity as a relatively immortal species. The president of my country, Nicolas Sarkozy, has recently declared that the moment has come to forget about the hatred and the grievances, and that the African man who has been out of universal history should make his comeback. Such a criminal idiocy means to throw a blanket of the crimes of imperialism and colonialism and pretend that we have colonized a space inhabited by ignorant human beings who had remained out of civilization. It, it would mean to forget the evil behind the principle of slavery. My answer is that it is not the moment to forget, but to give a higher political content to the legitimate anger, which is something very different. Our participation to great projects encompassing the common purpose of humanity is our answer to what Sarkozy represents, the voice and feathers of the oligarchy. Marcelo Vicky is going to explain soon after me his historical fight for the revival of Lake Chad, the Congo-Chad water transfer, crucial for at least 200 million human beings and for a whole continent. Sometimes, I know, and he told me yesterday, he, he, he gets a bit discouraged. What do you say? <laughs> that he is repeating the same things in 30 years. But <laughs> I am convinced. <laughs> I know people that are repeating things since, so, since much more many years and get <laughs> all the time more optimistic in the fight. <laughs> So, I am convinced, Marcello, that the hour of truth and opportunity is coming from, for all fighters like you. And when I presented this project at Niamey, the capital of Niger, I have a flavor of it last December. It will not be simple. It will, it's a road with bumpings and, as they say, in Africa, ostrich holes in the middle of the road, but the road is there. It is not a thing in itself, this Lake Chad project. It is part of an overall great project concept that Lino LaRouche fights since many, many years before I met him, 37 years ago, African-wide and worldwide. And if you have a doubt, you should reread his Lagos project. All the main points are there. We also are in Africa. We also have there our inland sea project to, for a blue revolution, to a blue revolution in Tunisia. An answer to a country and people abandoned today by the European states who prefer to bomb Libya rather than to develop the Maghreb. 
such a blue revolution to bring water into the depressions, the shots of southern Tunisia and Algeria, to create a breadbasket there, is directly related to a project from the French officer and topographer, François-Élie Rouder, dating back from 1874, Marcello, 1874, a hundred years before the Bonifica project for Lake Chad. I say that patience in such issues may be equality for some time, but when it lasts a century and a half, it becomes an accomplice for murder. They say that patience is sometimes a senility of nations and continents. We also have the project of a wall of forests to stop the desert, to plant millions of trees at the south of the Sahara across all Central Africa, a sort of green trail of about 7,600 kilometers, and the revival of the Jongle Canal in Sudan to launch there an agro-industrial project for Eastern Africa and Southwestern Asia. The concept is to give food to the hungry, not to export biofuels and ruin the land. For that project, the decision of the Egyptian government dates back from 1959. It started in 1978 with a magnificent, beautiful excavator machine which could dig three kilometers in 10 days. Its name was SARA. It was built in Germany and actioned by the French company Grand Travaux de Marseille, a beautiful example of a meaningful cooperation, not the Sarkozy-Merkel type of cooperation. <laughs> but everything was stopped in 1984 when the rebels of the Sudan People's Liberation Army start shooting at it. They, shot, they start shooting at Sarah and people around it and the British sponsoring. And the engineers and workers had to fly away. What is left of it today is a village called Canal in Sudan, with at the extremity of the interrupted canal, a garbage mountain where pigs groan near children bathing in dirty waters, and parts of bulldozers here and there digging devices rotting and abandoned, with even an arrow crane which dominates the market with some soldiers on top of it directing their handies towards the sky to try to reach international network, maybe to take orders. I am telling my French fellows, who are you to accept such a disgrace to continue? Imagine instead around the project, soldiers of the Corps of Engineers and workers digging polders, like in the Netherlands, and there are plenty of land around Lake Chad, around the Jongle Canal, in the Ah, Mandel uh, depression. There are many, many opportunities for that. Digging polders, planting trees, opening means of communication, the famous Transrapid for Africa. Impossible? Impossible? It is exactly what was said for China 30 years ago. And now we have the more extended network of high-speed trains in the world there in China. Imagine children going to schools, bilingual schools with a mother tongue, English or French or other language, with school books corresponding to the history of their respective countries, with the poetry of their own history, and not books dumped from Europe or the United States, inadequate for Africa, or promoting half crazy, that would be the best, or fully insane pseudo-religious beliefs from evangelical and Wahhabite cults or others. Imagine the joy of such children visiting true national museums, giving to them a living sense of the national identity, of the national history and progress, which is not only restricted to the borders of their own country, but which is also pan-African. 
from the prehistory when Africa has been the cradle of humanity, contrary to all what Sarkozy has to say. From this moment, where you see the prehistorical tools gathered in the middle of dust in a few museums, to the present moment of history with these developments that we are fighting for, and not museums for tourists or curious visitors, but museums as a cultural basis and platform for a national and pan-African development. Imagine then women like it started around a very limited, men are too lazy for that sometimes in Africa. Imagine women, and it's true, it's the children and the women that work the most. Imagine women, like it's starting to happen in villages in Senegal, in the Senegal portion of the forest wall, which has started. Women provided with land to work in beautiful gardens to produce fruits and vegetables for their families. No more the unique dish of rice as seen as empty space. But tomatoes, carrots, melons, cabbage, an appropriate diet for all. Imagine fresh and drinkable water, teams of students in medicine and nurses intervening, stopping malaria and eye diseases like onchocercosis, stopping intestinal diseases like amoebiasis, which are the main cause of deaths there. Imagine teams of forest experts teaching to the population how to grow and how to take care of trees. Imagine nuclear plants of the fourth generation, high temperature reactors, emerging in the process. And what do you have instead? The horrors of Desert Tech, an insane project to loot the sun of Africa against all principles of energy flux density, to create mirrors on a surface of about 30,000 square kilometers with a planned investment of 400 billion euros to bring to Europe 50% of its electricity. The same people who are saying that the Lake Chak project, the Blue Revolution in Tunisia, and the Wall Forest are too costly, too complicated to achieve, call for desert tech or railway projects to look to uranium copper oil, not to develop the hinterland. The contrary of what you have seen yesterday, this joining of the transcontinental railway in the United States, which is what is going to be needed from the uh, north to the south and from the west to the east in Africa. To bring that to the attention of our European populations in a moment of mass strike ferment can open their eyes to what the governments are doing. We have to bring to the mass strike ferment as our gift this immediate need of great projects for the good of Africa. And I have put it in the forefront of my presidential campaign. We are already getting support of mayors that we have never met before from overseas France, for example, from New Caledonia. And my plan is to create a ferment of mayors to put fire under the pants of our politicians. That's the sense of the campaign, with ideas. And not only with ideas. Also with all kind of matches. A ring of fire from the Pacific to the Atlantic under the moral asses of those who pretend to ignore, or worse, the situation. One of our mayor's friends is here and is going to speak on behalf of these other mayors of his friends, and of himself. But there is something else. It is a question of immigration. Sure, we have to develop Africa, but we have also a mission towards our immigrants. If the principle of hospitality and common development do not prevail at home, how it could be that we are going to develop Africa. Some people in Germany and in France, Marine Le Pen, 
pretends to be against immigration, but not against immigrants, and to develop Africa to prevent them from coming to Europe. We have to destroy such sophistry. It is already a fact, a given fact, that in Western Europe, a majority of what's left of the working class is from African origin and are parts of ourselves. There is nonetheless a difference, apparently, according to the last researchers, that the Africans have no portion of Neanderthal in their genes, while we Europeans have a portion of the Neanderthal men in our genes, about 4%. This is the idiocy people are speaking about, but it's a funny one. We have to develop Africa, but we have also to have a sense of mission towards our immigrants. They may be from Turkish origin in Germany. They are Sarazins. Uh, <clears throat> or from the Maghreb in France. But they are part of us. We have to open the gates for their intervention in the domestic policies where they are working. It's labor that defines, and this, all the Renaissance writers were specific on that issue, it's labor which defines the participation to labor which defines the nationality. The great mistake of all European progressives in the 60s of the 20th century is to have failed to connect their social struggles with the ferment of the African independences. And therefore, they have failed to inspire a mental decolonization. Imperialism, the British imperial rule, not only pits against each other its victims, people, as it was said yesterday, but also inside our countries create a situation of permanent internecine warfare. And we have to stop it from above through a great project. It is here that the European land bridge of common development from the Atlantic to the Sea of China corresponds to the great projects in Africa. It is a one. To save ourselves in Africa, we have obviously to dump the Euro system now but to replace it not by a retreat on our stuff, a national monetarism, but by a higher order, a higher sense of a community of purpose from the United States to Europe to Africa, as I said before, and that should be the basis for a Franco-German commitment, an anti-chauvinistic Franco-German commitment with a common commitment for a shared classical culture as shown yesterday night. We need a new Treaty of Westphalia to replace the European Union, and Africa is our test of immortality. Think of it at the required level. It is said by many Frenchmen, including well-meaning ones that I met recently, that it is almost impossible to train Africans in modern technologies, in mechanics, and I know that a few Chinese, I try to be polite saying a few, think the same. If you accept that, you have betrayed humanity in them and in yourself. What's the problem? It is a brutalization of the Africans, but also our own self-inflicted brutalization of our creative powers. Of course, if you try to train Africans in a mechanistic way, to apply formulas and obey to orders, they would reject that, rightly understanding that you consider them a substitute of machines, or substitute for machines. To teach to them, as to teach to your own population today, to teach to a youth lost in the grip of pleasure and pain, as it was repeated yesterday, again, you have to discover inside yourself a spark of mental life first to be able to provide it to the other. There is no spontaneous generation of mental life through habits or know-hows which doesn't correspond to life. Life, mental life, come always and only from active mental life. And how could we provide it 
to the other if we have not experienced ourselves. And most places where they teach something today teach not to be creative, to apply formulas instead. The advantage of the other, which is a principle of the Treaty of Westphalia, is based on a shared principle of creative discovery. A platform of development means for Africa and for us a change in the notion of time and of space, an insight in our humanity as a becoming. Public works, great projects, as against the absolutism of space and time. Not only the absolutism of the monarchs of the economy, as Roosevelt said. Cheikh and Tadiop, the great African thinker, rejected in the 60s from any position of power by the failure of the progressive forces to provide leadership, had a sense of this notion of continuity through change and the right for Africa to benefit from all human discoveries, not to fall into the trap of Africanism, the chauvinistic disease in reverse of imperialism, or better say, a weapon of imperialism to maintain Africans in a state of willful submission. Let's hear Sheikh and Tadiop in civilization or Barbary. One can see, then, how fundamentally improper is a notion so often repeated of the importation of foreign ideologies in Africa. It stems from a perfect ignorance of the African past, just as modern technologies and science came from Europe and the United States. Do did in antiquity universal knowledge stream from the Nile Valley to the rest of the world, particularly to Greece, which would serve then as a link. Consequently, no thought, no ideology is in essence foreign to Africa, which was their birthplace. It is therefore with total liberty that Africans can draw from the common intellectual heritage of humanity, letting themselves be guided only by the notions of utility and efficiency. At the point where we have arrived, I have to raise a last point who even hurts much more than all the rest, Europeans and Africans alike, usually, according to my experience. But it's key in the fight against the oligarchical principle inside ourselves, the question of music. I am tempted to say, it is a music, idiot. <laughs> because without an insight into the principle, and Lynn is going to talk about that this afternoon, because without an insight into the principle of classical musical composition, the ambiguity of a conflict between two or more voices that only can be solved in the human mind, without that, there could not be creative participation to the great projects as an adventure opening new gates of knowledge for us all. How can you understand the meaning of radiations, sort out those who could be a threat, a mortal threat to life, and those which could be a source of life. How could you do that if you have not tuned your mind? Glastigo is a way for human development, and the power for human development is based on what classical art brings, not on the tip of the tongue, but on the top of the mind. And there we have a key challenge. As the Bushes, and I must add the Careys and others, in the Skull and Bones Club, as they have brought the skull of Geronimo to encapture magically the power of wilderness for the oligarchy, and Theodore Roosevelt was the epitome of that, we have adopted as a social entertainment a noise which destroys us, a noise that we pretend is African music, but is in fact nothing than an escape from despair, or a propitiation of despair at this point. And viciously, bending in front of the oligarchy, we have socially adopted it as a way of life. The oligarchical looting of the despair of the looted as our entertainment. 
We have to stop that. And that's why culture is going to be the flag of my presidential campaign, congruent with what was said yesterday, what is going to be said today, and what we are going to repeat tomorrow, and all the tomorrows until we win, and much more after we win. <laughs> Without that commitment, I would be a corrupt swindler like all the others. To regain the human mind is our strategy because it is now change for the good or hell. We may die fighting, but we don't want to abandon the principle of thinking, our mission in the universe. We may die, but we don't want to die as a dinosaurs.